our recommended reading on this Trinity Sunday comes from the book of John, chapter 15, and I'll be reading verses 18 through 26. And uh, when I get to verse 26, I invite you to pay acute attention. This is the word of God. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belonged to the world, the world would love you as its own because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? Servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on, on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from my father, the spirit of truth who comes from the father, he will testify on my behalf. Here ends the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, at the heart of Christian spirituality, there's a concept called the Trinity. As Presbyterians, we believe in one God expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oddly enough, Scripture never mentions the word Trinity but there are lots of places that indicate the concept or the idea of this triune God. Genesis points to God as our creator. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is described as the living word incarnate and the Holy Spirit as the inspiration of faith within the believer's heart and mind. In this age of relative truth, we believe that through God's grace, we can express that God is for us in this world, in Jesus, by means of the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not an easy concept. This is not a concept for people who want to just come and go through the rote of believing in a God and come to worship him each week. This concept of Trinity has to use Holy Spirit wisdom to give you the fire, the interest, and the desire to wrestle with concepts of your faith that were passed down and through the generations, inspired by the very words of God, to stir you up to say, how can that possibly be three persons, yet one? Other words could be used to describe this Trinity idea, other than Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, for, and perhaps try on these, God the Creator, God the Savior, or God the Sanctifier. 
there are no easy explanations to the ground that we are walking here this morning, except to say, through the grace of God and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, open your hearts. The truth is, we do express one God in three distinct standalone entities. So the deal is, it's not necessarily all about the words or the language that we use to describe this concept. It's about the entities behind the Godhead, as we call it. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorites, said this, Everyone has warned me, the ordinary reader does not want theology. Give him plain, practical religion. Lewis goes on to say, I've rejected that advice. I think anyone who wants to think about God at all would like to have the clearest ideas and understanding that is available to them. The real issue this morning is not about what words we use to describe God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the God the Creator, um, the Savior, and the Sanctifier. It's all the same thing. To understand this complex God of ours is so, first of all, beyond all our understanding, the only way we can get a handle on it is to agree that there is a mystery, is there not, about our God and that only by grace can we attempt any kind of conversation like this about this Trinity God of ours. So how is it possible to be three distinct persons in one God? Simple answer. Mystery and faith. Someone once said, if you can understand an unknowable, omniscient, omnipresent God... If you can say you fully understand and comprehend that, then your God is too small. I'll let that one set for a minute. Now, all throughout Scripture, we are given all kinds of descriptions that this entity actually has this concept. And... Uh, I think the clearest one for most of us is in Matthew chapter 3, 16 to 17. Give a listen. I'm going to read slowly. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Did you hear an indication there that it was more than one God, but it was three distinct entities of that one God that was speaking that day? Now, Human examples are not sufficient to even try to dig through this concept. But one that we often use is this. Let's talk about H2O. I'm not talking about the Rugrats ride. I'm talking about H2O being water. Everybody's with me. Okay? Water is water. It is one thing. Agreed? Water is water. When it's in a liquid form, it's still water, but it's liquid. And you use it to drink, and you use it to swim in. If you don't know how to swim well, that's kind of one and the same. You drink it, and you swim in it at the same time. I thought of that one last night. Oh, boy, there's a double-decker right there. Nonetheless, you get the point. Liquid water, you are very familiar with. You use it, it is life-sustaining, you rely on it, right? All right. What happens in the winter? 
Lake Huron, if you're crazy, you can walk on it a little bit. It freezes. Also, my guess is that this weekend, you probably are going to open your freezer and pull out a few frozen waters to put in your adult beverages. All right. Well, anybody hear English? <laughs> One. OK. Um, the English are fanatical about how long their tea steeps. And so they use, they do not use K-cups. I'm telling you this. I have a very good English friend. The K-cups have this wonderful English breakfast. You just pop that sucker in there, and you make it, you let it drip right through. That is heresy to the British population, right? If you are British, you put the teapot on the back burner, and you boil that tea until steam comes out of the spout. And then you pour it in the cup, and you let it steep for three minutes. No longer, no shorter, three minutes. And you watch that. And if you know a British person, they will put their nose right over that. You know, it's amazing. All right, back to our water. So here we are. We have one concept, water. It is manifested, if you will, in three ways. In liquid, in, in frozen ice form, and in steam. Now, you've all seen them. You all know them. Is the steam not water? No, it's water. I'd like to see somebody try to make steam from something else beside water. Right? I'd like to... Well, no, I guess that won't, won't work. I was going to say, I'd like to see you try to make ice cubes out of something besides water. But, you know, they put frozen fruit in those things. Now they do everything. But you get the point, right? You have to have water. Um, if you gave up on liquid in terms of water and drank only fruit juice or, or whatever else, milk or whatever, and never drank another drop of water, your body would start to do terrible things to your insides. Water is truly the physical life-sustaining thing. So, again, there's no human example that's perfect, but that kind of should help you wrap your head around that. Um, this morning I've got three friends that are going to come up here and uh, help us out uh, one more time. And I've, I've thought about this, and we'll try this one out. I, again, it's a human example. It's not God's example. But... Here we are. Let's all gather together like a group. All right. Is this is good. This is great. No, you're fine. No, I love being cozy. Okay. Um, we are, what we all have here, can you just, without messing it up, can you hold up? Okay. We all have this, and this would be the Bible. Thank you. Okay. Just making sure you're all awake. All right. We have the Bible. Um, this, there is only one Bible, right? The Bible is the Word of God, inspired Word of God, all right? Um, Lori, you want to start? Okay. Read something there. We're all going to read the same thing. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Pass that down. Christy's going to read exactly the same thing. The helper will come, the spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me. And now Audrey's going to read the same thing. When the counselor comes, when I will send to you from the Father the spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Thank you. All right. Now, they're all reading the same word of God, right? It was all John 15, verse 26. Did you hear differences in there? Yeah, that's why, yeah. Um, 
the fact is, are we all reading the Bible? Yes. Are we all reading John 15, 26? Yes. Is it all the same truth? Yes. That is the entity. But if you only didn't hear that but heard Audrey's version, that is a distinct Bible reading in and of itself. Now, you and I would say, well, that's just a different version, right? And that's true to one extent. If there were no other versions that we knew or were available, this would be the Bible period to you. Do you get it? It's a distinct Bible unto itself. Which version? NIV? New International Version. Lori, which was yours? King James. And Lori was reading the King James. Again, before there was an NIV or before there was a good news, if you would have read this, that's the Bible. You would, if we said go to the Bible, you would go, okay, here it is. Right? A distinct Bible unto itself. And the same thing with Christie. If we didn't know about this, this would be your Bible, complete unto itself. It's not a part of it. It's, you know, they didn't leave anything out. It's not a version technically. It is the inspired word of God. Yet, it's all different. Thank you. Um, I hope this is messing with your mind. I do indeed. You know, that makes me feel good. If it's messing with your mind and you're going, now wait a minute, I've got to think about this. Thank you. Get it? Now, now you're grinding down into some theology. Now you're trying to figure out, wait a minute, how can this be? But it is, I, I kind of get it. I am happy this morning if you leave this sanctuary saying, I kind of get it. All right? That's, that's a, a success story. Please leave and say, I kind of get it but not really. So where are we this morning? What difference does this make, Pastor Kathleen? I mean, really? Seriously? I'm as serious as a heart attack. It does make a difference. Why? What difference does it make that you will spend some more time looking at and thinking about why would God do that? And it's not just because he can. It's a why question. Why would God go to all this trouble about three persons in one and one in three and all for one and one for all and, and whatever? Why? Why? Because it'll change your life. If thinking about the Trinity deepens your sense of understanding deepens your sense of mystery about God's nature, that he is the God of beauty and wonder and awe, and that he is deep and so complex that you could never understand him. If you would know from this that God is bursting with the life of the Spirit, with his love, and that he is active today, that God is the most holy, loving, living creature, fascinating being in the universe. And if that indeed boggles your mind, would I or you really want a God that was less complicated than that? Would you really want a God that you could understand totally? Think about that. Wouldn't we be in trouble in this world if we totally understood the heart and the mind and the power of God, I would be scared to death. I want a complicated, unimaginable God for me to worship, to talk to, to pray to, to serve. I am honored to serve such a mighty, powerful God. And I don't have to understand it all. All I have to do is open my closed heart enough to try. 
And if I do that, I have reason for joy in the midst of tragedy, to laugh even at myself in the mirror. You see, and life on this earth with my mighty, powerful God is all good. Let me leave you with something that Paul said to the Romans. It's in Romans 11. It says this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? From him and through him and in him are all things. And to him be the glory forever. In the name of the triune, triune God, I say, go forth in this world and live in his mystery and be glad. Amen.